We are live. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the staying, well, to the UC vlog. I was going to say to the staying connected with Dr. Ian Bulow podcast, but uh, that's a different show at a different time. <laughs> On that note, if you were unaware, um, I do have a podcast. Uh, it's called Staying Connected with Dr. Ian Bulow, so feel free to check it out. And, you know, I'm, I'm finishing up a series on the UC vlog that is in response to some chiropractic students from life, shout out to Paul West and the Upper Cervical Club crew, that were asking really good questions for Upper Cervical uh, doctors. And one of the questions that was asked had to do with our favorite research and where we get our research and things like that. And so I figured I would go through this study, symptomatic reactions, clinical outcomes, and patient satisfaction associated with upper cervical care, a prospective multi-center cohort study. And um, this is really one of my absolute favorite articles to reference in chiropractic presentations. I also reference this article and I send it to providers anytime I send a provider report out to a referring medical provider that maybe sends me a patient, I will send them um, an, an update on the patient as well as this article right here. I'm just pulling up the live on my phone, so if any of you guys have any questions or comments during the um, presentation today, please do let me know <clears throat> or just comment or ask away as we kind of go through this. Um, so this, let's just go through the title here. And, um, and the, the title kind of alludes to the importance of this article. And shout out to Dr. Kirk Erickson and Bo Rochester, um, Eric Hurwitz, um, for putting this study together back in, when was it? It was published in 2011. I remember when they were putting this together, I was at an upper cervical conference and they were calling for offices to participate around the time of my graduation back in 2008 but it's a great study for a few reasons um, one of the reasons when you look at it is that it is a prospective study right a lot of studies in chiropractic are kind of retroactive retrospective you know we saw these patients over the last year and here's what happened to them and that's almost like cherry picking you know um, where a prospective study is really great because you're setting out to take data um, regardless of the results, basically. You're saying, we're gonna see what's gonna find, what we're gonna find out, and we're gonna document it um, proactively as it comes along. Um, the other thing that was really cool about this study, it was one of the first studies that involved multiple upper cervical techniques, right? So in a world, now remember, this was back almost 20 years ago now, um, but back in the early 2000s and the late 90s, um, chiropractic and especially upper cervical was still a very, um, I don't know if it's little dog syndrome or pride or ego, but it was a very um, standoffish sort of arena. You know what I mean? Upper cervical chiropractors did not work together synergistically, collaboratively. It was all about my technique is best and yours sucks, and I would never refer to you. You know, that kind of emotion. Um, this was before the internet in the 90s, before Facebook groups and things like that. So everything was very insular and very group think. Um, and with the, with the establishment of the Upper Cervical Health Centers of America franchise and then the Council on Upper Cervical Care, um, all those walls began to come down in the early 2000s. And um, so this multi-center aspect of this study was one of the first of its kind where you had multiple different upper cervical techniques um, involved at the same time. And what they were tracking were um, symptomatic reactions. And the main thing here with symptomatic reactions was saying, hey, is there any kind of flare up? You know, if someone goes to the chiropractor I heard that you know you could stroke them out, right? Um, or I don't know, crazy headaches or neck pain or something. Like, is there a reaction that some would deem to be a negative thing um, with upper cervical care? Clinical outcomes. Um, 
what difference does it make outside of our chiropractic clinical indicators? What impact does it have on, on overall health and well-being? Um, and then patient satisfaction. What do patients think? What do they think about this upper cervical stuff? And so really cool study for a lot of different reasons. One of the other reasons I love this study is because of the data that it acquired when it comes to understanding your target market, which is kind of a a side effect byproduct benefit of this study um, that I'm going to go into at the end. But um, let's just go over the abstract here, and then we may just peruse through it and see what we find. Um, But if you look, and and again, this, 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 this um, vlog will likely the audio be ripped for podcasts. So I'm going to read through some of these things. Um, But the background of the study just was pointing out that observational studies previous have previously shown that adverse events following manipulation to the neck and or back are relatively common. Hmm. That's interesting. Although these reactions tend to be mild in intensity and self-limiting. However, no prospective study has examined the incidence of adverse reactions following spinal adjustments using upper cervical techniques and the impact of this care on clinical outcomes. So basically, research is born in a lot of ways by seeing a need. Um, There's always been the detractors in our in the healthcare that would say negative things about chiropractic because the possibility of adverse events. Um, But they're basically cherry picking and definitely not looking at upper cervical, which most upper cervical techniques are in spinal neutral. um, And so by definition, aren't really manipulation because there's no end range of motion cavitation with the exception of knee chest, perhaps. Um, But knee chest was even included in this study because knee chest Yes, it involves an end range um, adjustment um, and uh, with often a cavitation, but it's in a very controlled manner when it's done right. Um, and so um, I believe, I think Kessinger, he's, he's always got his hands in research, may have been involved in this study, but I'm fairly confident that knee chest was one of the groups involved. So shout out to those guys too and gals. Um, methods. Here's the other thing. This is really, really important consecutive new patients. What does that mean? As a prospective study, um, they were all the offices involved. Um, this was offices of 83 chiropractors. Isn't that amazing? 83 offices participated in this study. That is like, that's really incredible. That's really great. And consecutive new patients basically means that they had to survey and study the next five new patients in the door. The next five new patients in the door. That means you can't cherry pick. You can't, you can't say like, oh, I'm going to do this study with all of the, uh, am I allowed to say this, soccer moms? <laughs> like, I don't know in today's culture if I'm allowed to say that <laughs> stereotype. But um, middle-aged adults, male or female, doesn't make a difference. But, um, but yeah, I'm not allowed to do take the easy cases. It might be a person in a wheelchair. It might be a person post-surgery. It might be a person with seizures. I have to take them as they come, the next five consecutive new patients. And um, we're going to ask them to fill out some clinical outcome measures, right? Number one, um, neck pain. Wait, I didn't mean to highlight this. Number one, uh, the neck pain disability index. Number two, the Oswestry back pain index. Number three, an 11 point NRS scale for the neck, the head, the back mid and low back. Um, number four, treatment. Uh Oh, don't love that word. <laughs> treatment satisfaction. And then number five, any symptomatic reactions. And so data was collected as a baseline. And after approximately two weeks, here's another really cool aspect of this study. They did these outcomes when the patients came in at the, at the initial consult and everything. And then two weeks later, that's not a lot of time. You know what I mean? Um, If you're looking for clinical outcome measures, you're giving yourself just two weeks. Now, keep in mind, too, we're tracking not just headache and neck pain, which a lot of people would associate with upper cervical care. We're also tracking mid-back and low-back pain. 
And what you're going to see is you're going to see some marked significant improvements in the entire spine in just two weeks time with upper cervical care. Because it's not just about the neck. It's not just about the upper cervical. The head is really a steering wheel for the entire spine. Um, a patient reaching subclinical status for pain and disability was defined as a follow-up score um, of under three, NRS under 10% respectively. Symptomatic, uh, here's another interesting thing. Symptomatic reaction is defined as a new complaint not present at baseline or worsening um, of the present complaint by over 30% um, occurring within 24 hours of an upper cervical procedure. So the question is, was there anything that happened within 24 hours in a shift of over 30% of whatever their baseline was? So some pretty awesome statistical um, standards there. I like all that. So let's talk about the results. Remember, we've got 83 chiropractors, upper cervical chiropractors participating in this study. Um, there were a total of 1,090 patients that participated, that completed the study, having a total of almost 5,000 office visits over the course of a couple of weeks, um, requiring 2,653, that's 2.4 upper cervical adjustments per patient over the course of 17 days. Now that's an interesting thing right there. If we just stop right there for a minute, because one of the things we're gonna talk about in the To Your Success webinar coming up, we're gonna be killing sacred cows. And one of the sacred cows in the chiropractic profession is you must see patients you know, three days a week for 10 weeks straight, down to twice a week for 10 weeks, down to once a week for 10 weeks, or 10 months, or who knows, whatever. Um, if you're getting into the practice of upper cervical and you want to know what the recommendations should be, what the standard is, here's an article that was done involving 83 upper cervical offices across the United States. And there was an average of 2.4 adjustments done over the course of 17 days. Two adjustments, two and a half adjustments. What I can tell you is that most upper cervical people will check on average an adult about twice a week for the first month or so. Now, we in my office, we do twice a week for six weeks. For extremely complex cases, we might do three times a week for two weeks. But very rarely are you going to see three times a week for a month or three times a week for two months in an upper cervical clinic. Why? Because most patients don't need that. 2.4 adjustments in 17 days. That means on average, you theoretically could see someone three times in the course of two weeks, right? So you probably wanna see them more than that because that's just the average. Some probably needed more, some probably needed less. So whether you see them twice a week or three times a week, that's up to you and, and your particular technique system and how your learning curve is, what the results you're getting, the stability you're getting. But just know as a goal, in the first two weeks of care, two or three adjustments is so far the standard, you know? Um, so just give you some insight there. Um, let's see, uh, let's see, 338 patients, 31% had symptomatic reactions, meaning the accepted definition. What was the accepted definition? An increase in the presenting one of the baseline complaints by over 30% within 24 hours. So 30%, now here, this is so cool. So watch this. People go, is it going to get worse before it gets better? We can now say, well, there's a 30% chance you may experience a new complaint or a worsening of a complaint by over 30%, right? There's a 31% chance that might happen. It's, it's not a high percentage, but it might. You might be a little sore. You might have a dull headache. There might be a flare-up of your presenting issues. You know what I mean? a 31% chance. Um, intense symptomatic reactions. Ooh, what's that mean? That means over a symptomatic reaction of over eight, and I think that's on a zero to 10 scale, um, occurred in 5.1%, right? So there's a very small chance that the symptomatic reaction will be over an eight out of 10. 
in the in the uh, numerical rating scale for neck pain, headache, mid back pain. You know what I mean? So five percent chance of that. So that's not likely at all. Thirty percent chance, maybe a little mild soreness, stiffness, headache, that sort of thing. Um, outcome assessments were significantly improved for neck pain and disability, headache, mid back pain, as well as as well as lower back pain and disability uh, following care with a high uh, level of patient satisfaction. Dun, da, da, da. That's sort of like the winning statement. Here's a research article that shows a significantly uh, a significant improvement in neck pain, headache, mid-back, and I'll show you the percentages in a minute. The 83 chiropractors administered over 5 million career adjustments. Now, that was just an average based on they would ask the chiropractors how long you've been in practice, how many patients you see a week, how many adjustments do you give in a day, that sort of thing. Um, And none of these chiropractors reported an incidence of a serious adverse event, a.k.a. stroke, a.k.a. you know hospitalization, stuff like that. Um, in their inc- in their entire careers. Now, that was not a prospective statement. That was a retrospective statement, so we have to take that in context. Um, but what one of the things this is saying is this is a very safe and effective way to practice chiropractic. Uh, conclusions, and then we'll kind of like, I'll go over some of the subtle benefits that I noticed whenever I was reading this, but conclusions, upper cervical care may have a fairly common, excuse me, upper cervical chiropractic care may have a fairly common occurrence of mild intensity symptomatic reactions um, of short duration, under 24 hours, and rarely severe intensity. However, outcome assessments were significantly improved with less than three weeks of care with a high level of patient satisfaction. Although our findings need to be confirmed in subsequent randomized studies for definitive risk-benefit assessment, The preliminary data shows that the benefits of upper cervical chiropractic care may outweigh the potential risks. Um, You think? (laughs) This is kind of like, you know, the research political statement. But um, no, I think it's pretty clear. Um, So let's let's go into some of the highlights. Um, This goes into a little bit of background here. Um, I am not going to go through this today, Um, but I'm going to go over the methods. Here's some cool things. These are the techniques. Um, that were used in the study. So that's pretty cool. Um, We've got um, Atlas Orthogonal, Advanced Orthogonal. This was back before Advanced Orthogonal um, had the the brand update and the organizational updates where Advanced Orthogonal kind of split and became Epic and Advanced Orthogonal. Um, So this was, there's probably some, um, so this is all like the, the percussion sound wave instrument adjusting, basically Atlas Orthogonal, Advanced Orthogonal. Nine doctors uh, participated from that group. In Blair, there were 11 doctors that participated. Knee chest, there were 16. 24 NUCA doctors and 15 orthospinology slash grostic doctors. And so this kind of goes into um, how many, or not how many, but it describes the techniques there, which is pretty cool. Um, how many patients were seen, the percentage so as a percentage, it looks like uh, NUCA carried 28% of this study, 27.8. Um, orthospinology was 21%. Knee chest was third with uh, 17% of the patients, 17.8. Blair was 14.4. And Atlas Orthogonal, Advanced Orthogonal was 11.9. Um, oh, wait, sorry, there's more. I didn't even realize... Uh, spinal orthopedic neurological advancement and research sonar two point they had three doctors i don't even know what that technique is <laughs> no offense to sonar i gotta find that one out look it de- describes it developed by thomas elliott jr who was a nuca practitioner etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, and then toggle recoil there was um five toggle recoil doctors shout out to toggle um the unsung hero in upper cervical the og of upper cervical toggle recoil um, I'm also planning on doing an introduction like to upper cervical boot camp in 2023 that'll go over the basics of toggle and Blair, but it's not a full on Blair series. So it's really great for students and doctors that are curious about upper cervical, but 
maybe don't want to look into certification. They just want to freshen up their skills. You know, the, the, the nuances of a pisiform contact, the nuances of a drop headpiece in terms of patient place, placement and tension, specific contact points on the Atlas, um, some theories in terms of listings and x-ray analysis, things like that. Um, so if you're interested in that, let me know, but that's coming up to an upper cervical or excuse me, to a chiropractic school near you. Um, so that's that, but that's going to be kind of side posture drop based. All right, back to it. Approval and funding, recruitment and participation of chiropractors, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Re-exams, symptomatic reactions defined, data analysis. All you research heads can enjoy this. Um, here's an interesting table. Um, frequency and distributions and or means of selected sociodemographic clinical and healthcare variables. So out of the studies. Now, here, here's why this matters to a certain extent. This is what I wanted to get at understanding your target market right this is a randomized prospective study so who is it who is it that comes to the office of an upper cervical chiropractor right um we know that according to this study 699 were female versus 391 were male so that's 64 percent female 64.1 percent to be exact and 35 percent 36%, 35.9% male. So you've got basically a, you know, a 65, 35 split of female to male, not a huge surprise, but that's kind of interesting. Um, what about the duration of their clinical issues, right? 73.48%, almost 75% of people their issues were chronic over 13 weeks of having an issue, over three months of having an issue. Um, within three weeks, or sorry, within 13 weeks, three to 13 weeks, sub-acute, 13%, acute, 13%. But the majority of people, these are chronic issues. So you want to know your target market in upper cervical. You are talking to people that have been dealing with issues for over three months on average. I think that's valuable information to know. I think that changes how I communicate or should change how I communicate online um, or in networking groups or to other healthcare providers. Do you have patients that are dealing with chronic headaches, chronic neck and back issues, chronic ill health, chronic neurologicals, things like that? Um, I wanna skip down to this here. This is one of my favorite um, areas of the study and it's not even the main focus of the study but I think it again for the purposes of marketing and branding and understanding your target market if you are looking into the practice of upper cervical this table right here the frequency and distributions of presenting chief complaints the frequency and distributions of presenting chief complaints so you want to know who's coming to see you. We already saw that 75% are female, somewhere around, no, 65, 65% female. Um, what are they dealing with? Check this out. Cervical pain and dysfunction was listed as the primary complaint in 35% of the patients walking in the door. So right away, one third of the people are gonna list neck pain as the primary reason for coming into your office. Now, you may be surprised. You might say, I thought they were going to come in for subluxation assessment. <laughs> Not really. Um, they are coming in for neck pain. Shocker. You're an upper cervical specialist. Shocker. Now, it affects the low back. Oh, look at this. Lumbopelvic pain. 299 patients listed that as their primary issue. That's 27.5%. That's another third just about. What about now it, the rest of it breaks down like headaches is 13%. Mid back pain is 5%. Lower leg issues like sciatica are 3.6%. Shoulder pain, arm pain, you know, that accounts for 13, five is 18, three is 21, two is 23. Another 25% basically cumulatively um, is going headaches, you know, mid back, 
leg, shoulder, arm, you know what I mean? So what you have, and I think this is really important to understand, is the vast majority of the patients walking in your door, like 80, 90% here, are dealing with neck pain, back pain, headaches, leg and arm pain, shoulder pain, that's it. That's the majority. Now, you may say, no, oh, but we do much more. And you're 100% correct. You're 100% correct. I'm just telling you that in 2000 and whenever this study came out, it was published in 2011, out of 83 upper cervical offices across the United States and maybe even the globe, I have to double check, the vast majority of people coming in, their main clinical issue had to do with the head, neck, shoulders, mid, and low back. Sorry. Now, you could either deny that or you could double down on that. And you could put out um, a Facebook ad tomorrow that says, we do, we have seen excellent results with adults suffering with chronic ongoing headaches, neck and back issues, and things like that. How? Click here to learn more. Now, when they come in, of course, we're talking to them about subluxation, excuse me, subluxation, spinal misalignment, things like that, and the cause of these problems, right? But clearly identifying the people who get the greatest satisfaction from your care is a smart thing in business. Why? Because they're going to get the best results quickly, within two weeks. And then you get to be the one who provides that for them. They then think about that and say, well, maybe this would be help my child who's got bedwetting issues. Maybe this would help my husband with ulcerative colitis. Yeah, you think? Maybe. But at first glance, they're not going to think of you, at least not right now, at least not in the early 2000s. Um, now, also below that, there were 20 patients that came in due to fibromyalgia, 19 patients with disequilibrium, things like Meniere's. Um, TMJ problems, facial pain problems, blood pressure, neurological diseases, brain dysfunction, six people for wellness care. Ha! Ah! So <laughs> God bless those offices. Um, out of, what was it, a thousand patients, there were six. So when I said people didn't come in to say, hey, can you check my subluxations? I stand corrected. There were six of them that just wanted to be evaluated for wellness. So if you want to, if you want to attract that, Go for it. That is a niche among niche among niche among niche um, target market. So pretty cool. Um, if we go to um, some of the outcomes and we look here, um, the, let's see, neck pain, right? Just the neck pain uh, numerical rating scale um, was on average a five, um, at the follow-up two weeks later, on average, was a two. So it changed by 56.8%. So that means we can tell people that on average, if you've got neck pain, you're going to see an over 50% reduction in the first two weeks on average. That's pretty cool. Um, headache on average was listed as a 5.1% change of a 1.9 so on average the change there was it again three percent 3.2 a 62.8 percent change is a really good chance we'll see improvements we should see some change again the question is asked how you know how many times do patients ask the question um, how soon can i see changes well, first of all, it depends on your condition, how long it's been there, the complexity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But if your chief complaint is neck pain, there's a good chance you'll see about a 50% improvement in the first two weeks. If, you're, if your chief complaint is headaches, there's a good chance you'll see a 63% improvement in the first two weeks. What about, what about mid-back pain? Most people on average rated it a 4.7 out of 10. Follow-up was a 2.0 out of 10. That's a 58% change. You're going to have, uh, let's just keep going real quick. Um, low back pain, 57% improvement. So just looking at 
neck pain, headache, mid-back, and low back pain. Most people improve by over 50% within the first two weeks. That's kind of massive. That's kind of amazing. Without any drugs, without any surgery, without putting anything into you, without taking anything out of you, we can expect your body to improve by over 50%. So if you're on, if, if your pain rating is at an eight out of 10 now, we probably should be able to get that under five within two weeks. Pretty cool, pretty, pretty incredible. Um, neck pain disability index, that improved by 47%. The Oswestry low back pain index, disability index improved by 45%. These issues won't impact your day-to-day -day activities as bad. Within two weeks, you should see almost uh, improvement by almost 50%. Now, so is upper cervical care just about the neck? No, dumb dumb. <laughs> I use the term dumb dumb with my kids. No, dumb dumb. It's about your whole spine and it's about the proprioceptive reflex arcs. So if your head's out of balance, your proprioceptive, out, your proprioceptive system's out of balance. And if that's out of balance, your lower back postural muscles will be out of balance because your brain is confused about where your feet are centered over gravity. And your body is going to react with muscle spasms in the face of instability. Um, let's see here, frequency distributions and averages of symptomatic reactions by type of reaction. This is just kind of like a summary here. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. let's see, symptomatic reaction, neurological cir cir and circulatory. So, um, tiredness, radiating pain, headache, dizziness arm leg weakness so this is this is people the types of symptomatic reactions you can expect so in the neck for example musculoskeletal you know in terms of like soreness stiffness things like that there were 394 patients that reported some neck discomfort the intensity was a 3.4 with a deviation of two. Um, so that was 5% of all symptomatic reactions. Um, let's see, those that had an intensity change of over eight, like the severe, was 2% of people. Lumbar symptomatic reactions, 3%, um, thoracic's 3%. So in terms of like the spine, it's pretty evenly distributed. You know, you might have some soreness or stiffness in your neck or back, but that's only, you know, 3%, 3%, 3% is really, really small. Um, tiredness, you might be fatigued after the adjustment. Well, go figure, your body's resetting, right? So the thing is, these are symptomatic reactions. These are not negative outcomes. These are your body changing, your spine straightening out, your metabolism getting used for the first time in how long, because your body's trying to repair and heal. So that can create some tiredness. Um, radiation, that doesn't sound great, but there could be some changes there, 4%. Headache, 4%. Dizziness, 3%. Arm and leg weakness, 4%. Tinnitus, 3%. I mean, these are tiny, tiny numbers. Um, let's see down in here. Symptomatic reaction, psychological, so confusion. 30% of people, that's funny. It seems like opposite of what we normally see, people's heads clearing up. But that's 3%, depression, 3%, mood, 3%, sleep, you know, losing sleep, 3%. Um, all of those that were over eight were like none. There was 1% of people that had a headache change in intensity, 1.6% of over eight on the numerical scale, eight to, uh, zero to 10, and 1% um, and tiredness and, and radiating issues. but most of the time, if they're going to experience anything serious, anything over a percent, it was neck, tiredness, radiating pain, and headache, which kind of makes sense too. I've seen that with patients that have like arthritis and disc degeneration in their neck that's pretty severe. We go and we adjust them. As that spine straightens out, it's like straightening out really crooked, nasty teeth. And so you're going to have a lot of inflammation uh, in that process which can create some stenosis and cause some uh, radiating numbness, tingling, and pain down the arm. 
Um, obviously, if they come in with that, we expect it to reduce. But if they come in with just nasty arthritis and just neck and shoulder pain, they may get a little bit of radiation as that lower neck begins to change and shift that arthritis around. It doesn't always feel good. Um, but this allows you to answer the questions that patients ask. You know what I mean? Um, table six here, estimated effect, estimated effects, um, risk ratios, and 95% confidence intervals of symptomatic reactions on levels of satisfaction. Um, so the chances of having any symptomatic reaction at all, um, this is a comparison of, it's kind of mapping what are the odds that you'll get a symptomatic reaction, but it's categorizing it by people based on their satisfaction levels, right? So the people that were highly satisfied, you know what I mean? Satisfaction, 10 out of 10. Excellent. Um, they did not have much symptomatic reactions. One, of, Some of them, serious ones, there was a 1% there. Um, I'm not even going to try and break this one down, but this is a way that you could basically see, is there a correlation between the people who had symptomatic reactions and how they rated their satisfaction levels? You know what I mean? And so you start looking and it's not really a surprise the higher people had any kind of like symptomatic reactions their satisfaction rating kind of waned a little bit um but that table is pretty loaded so i'm not going to go into the minutia of each each one um and that's pretty much what i like about this study you know what i mean um it's a great study it's 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 absolutely open source you can get it for free it was published in um, the Musculoskeletal Disorders, um, BMC, Musculoskeletal Disorders, open access. Um, so check it out. Um, but this, I hope it shows you that um, upper cervical procedures are way more than just about the neck. They impact the entire spine and they offer... Um, a very safe and effective outcome. And that was the last thing. I remember whenever I heard Dr. Rochester speak on this initially, very rarely can you find treatment options in healthcare. And yes, I said treatment options because I'm talking about outside of our world. Um, there was a total satisfaction rating in this um, study of a 9.1 out of 10. So on a scale of zero to 10, the average satisfaction was 9.1. And you had over 50% improvement in neck, you know, mid back, head, low back pain in under two weeks with zero or close to zero serious adverse reactions. The most common 30% of people would have an over 30% intensity, primarily involving the neck and the spine and the head, soreness, stiffness. But it's not like what you see with the drug ads, you know, the intensity of risk uh, with, with chronic use, you know? So I love this study because it shows it is a safe and effective form of care for people with chronic problems. It shows that upper cervical impacts the entire spine and it shows you what type of people are coming into your office looking for your care. So you should take note of that and incorporate that in your branding and marketing systems. All right, guys, that's it for me. It is Tuesday, November 29th. Remember, on Thursday, um, December the 1st at 12 noon Eastern time, the To Your Success webinar is coming to a portal near you. Register today. I will see you guys then. Love and appreciate you. Bulo, out.